So I have three young kids, and uh, I have three. So I just had one this last week. So we had a baby boy on uh, Tuesday, so not even a week old, actually. Massive well. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I want you to draw for me a smiley face up top there. That's okay. So while she's drawing, so I, they love markers. And uh, my wife the other week fell asleep. And they woke up, and she woke up, and uh, I wish I had brought this picture. Like, they are covered head to toe with, like, self-tattoos. And the funny thing was that they, the back was all tattooed up, too. So they had helped each other out, coloring on each other, not to just, you know. That's great. I like it. Yeah. Now, can you do a frowny face on the other side? Do you want a different color, or do you want the same one? Yeah. You got it. Is it funny? That's I'm pretty funny. good. I my like hands, it. My hands are more. No, you're doing you did really well. Can you guys see that? Yeah, here we go. Take a bow. <laughs> okay, am so I done? You're good. Yep. Okay. You get to pick the next person who gets to come up. How did you do it? Again? Not yet what though, is? that's fine. <laughs> Okay, who else wants to do it? We'll get there. Everybody's chicken. Yeah, I think he's volunteering me. Yeah. <laughs> you want to do it? Okay. Let's see the chicken. Well, listen, um, I wanted to do things just a little differently tonight. So I, could, I have slides. Actually, I have a bunch of slides we could go through. But I kind of think that may be a little boring. And, and I'd rather just have this be a little bit more interactive and talk some and maybe also make sure that we hit the questions that you guys want to you guys want to go over. So the goal, my goal with this is that not necessarily that you're happy by the time you've left, you've gone from sad to happy, but that that if your eyesight, you know, is bothering you and you're here, that, that we have a little more information about how to get here or, or at least kind of what questions to ask and, and how to navigate things. A little bit more of a map, right, rather than just a specific set of uh, directions for you. So with that in mind, um, let me tell you a story. So I'm renovating a home. We bought a home. It's a 100-year-old home, and it's really neat. We love it, and it's also like the worst decision we've ever made. <laughs> so it's been going on for a number of years, and, uh, and we finally got to the point where we needed some internet service there. We need Wi-Fi there so we can you know, keep things safe and whatnot because we're not living there. It's not habitable. So I called up a provider. And they sent me a modem, right? I have this modem set up there and power's on. And, and I go over there the other week and uh, the modem's not working. I don't get any Wi-Fi. So I call, and I'm sure, I'm sure you guys have had this in terms of customer service, right? You call, and what do you get? Yeah, just like here, ironically, right? I mean, <laughs> yes, call here, it's the same thing, unfortunately. That's not too funny. but. Um, and so I get this computer, and the computer says, unplug it. Well, actually, it asks me a question or two, and I have to input, you know, is this red light blinking? Yes, this red light is blinking. So I go through this, this kind of algorithm that they have, and the computer says, okay, I know, I know what to do. You should do this. And so I go and do that, which was basically unplug it and plug it back in again, which I'd already tried because I was <laughs> smart before I called them. And... Nothing happens. It's the same, right? So I finally get a hold of a person, and I ask them, I said, was the computer really doing anything, or was it just trying to kind of make sure that I had tried that beforehand? And they said, no, the computer was just making sure that you had tried that before you talked to a person. So, so I need someone else to draw something. Who's next? You get to pick, because you did. Do you want to go? No, I didn't. Okay, no, you were going to pick somebody else, but that's okay. Oh, what color do you want? Blue. Blue, okay. So I want you to draw a, this is kind of hard. I want you to draw a function, or let me give you another word for that, a, yeah, a function. Yeah, I know, that's way harder, right? Let's say, uh, how about, who, who can help her out? What's something that you could describe a function with in terms of a picture? What's that? Driving a car? Anything else? This is a function. This is a, this is a function. That's right. <laughs> uh, 
I was thinking more about a mathematical function, like oh. if A then B, or something oh. like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. A plus, yeah, E equals MC squared, or something like that. A plus B equals C, how about that? A minus B. Okay, fantastic, thank you. So, um, so when I called in, the this I won't name the provider, but they they were basically treating me as as there was some function there that if they did you know if I did a and this time not plus b but minus b, then I would get this answer c that I needed. And uh, my second point is that these kind of things that we're talking about in terms of options for your eyes are not always this easy. In fact, they rarely are. They're more often something like. Let me draw here. It may be like, I'm going to draw some math symbols here, but we may have a function of A, B, C, D, E, F. And then the answer to that function is a few options, one, two, and three. Does that make sense? There's kind of, there's, there's not, there's a lot that has to be put into the, the function and there's not one specific answer that comes out. So a better way of thinking about this may be with my kids. So I have a daughter and she'll be five in January and I have a three-year-old and, um, and a one-week-old. So I still can't believe that. It's very surreal. And uh, when, I, when it's their birthday, I can't buy the same thing for my daughter that I buy for my son. It's not gonna work. Because they have different interests. They want different things, right? So I can't just go to the store and say, a birthday present, give me one. And then they have something that's good for all three kids. But I have to find something that, that, that's gonna be specific to them. And, and that's the other goal of tonight, is to try to help you kind of figure out what it is that you need to be asking when you see your doctor and what options there are and, and why some of these discussions take so long and why they're so involved when you end up deciding what to do for your eyes. Does that make sense so far? Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I ask you something real quick? Sure. Your name, oh, my name is, sorry. There we go, we should have started at the beginning. My name, I even have a, a board. My name is Dr. Wade. Yeah, Matt Wade. There you go. So a little background about me. I'm originally from Utah. And I did my medical school training in Washington, D.C., which I really enjoyed. And um, which was kind of neat because I have some relatives from Virginia. So I actually ended up meeting a lot of relatives out there that I had never met before when I was out there going to school. Then I came here and did a residency here. And then I did a fellowship with that gentleman up there. Um, I don't know if you, any of you knew him, but his name is Roger Steinert. And I'm going to choke up. But he... He was a father figure to me and just a phenomenal, phenomenal person. In fact, um, I brought these with me because these were his reading glasses. These are the glasses he would, he would put on to kind of read through charts and whatnot. And when he passed away um, and his office was here and they asked if we wanted to keep anything, I wanted to keep those so I could remember to see things the way he saw things. So. Um, I really feel fortunate to have had the training I had and to have worked with the people I did and uh, that led me to here. And I met my wife here in California. She's a Californian, so, so we're not going anywhere. We're going to stay in California. And now I have California kids. It's really incredible. Okay, so that's the intro. So I want you guys to ask me what questions you have on your mind. And, and there is this time a good and a bad question, okay? A bad question, I will say, because the recording is, is going to be something that says, I have X, Y, and Z disease, and tell me what to do in my particular function, right? A better question would be, if someone has A, B, and C, or if, some, if this is present, like what are some things to think about? That's because I just don't want your particular personal information to be uh, recorded there. So pterygium surgery options. Okay. What else? Any, anybody else? So, 
Okay, so I'm hearing two things. So I'm hearing changing prescription, what to do with the changing prescription. So there was changing prescription, but there was another question, and that was surgery. Surgery, surgery options. Am I hearing you right? Okay, I want to make sure we got it. Okay, I like that question. So I'm going to write that as increasing age, does that equal worsening vision? And if, if not, can we do anything about it? Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll talk about genetics and all on all of that business. Yes. Um, my friend and I came tonight to learn about cataracts. Okay. Um, how you best deal with them? What's modern technology? Sure. Um, and anything else we can talk. Okay. What else? Sort of a related question to the aging thing and how it changes your vision. What about? The time it takes to accommodate when you look at something close up and then look at something in distance. Okay. For me, if I spend a lot of time reading something close up, it may ha be half a day before I can focus on something farther away. Okay, so we're going to talk about, and you know, I am entirely too tall for this. Distance versus near. Change. Okay. Yes. So the question I'm hearing, uh, if, I'm, if I'm hearing this correctly, is what about LASIK surgery and does it fix everything or, or will I still have issues with distance or near vision? So refractive lens exchange. Okay, what else? We talk about whatever you want. So, since you're not doing a projection, can we turn off the lights a little bit? So yeah, see your turn that's great. Bit? I like that. Right. That's a great one. Okay, so let me let me just kind of and again, feel free to chime in. I wanted this to be a little more interactive and just hope you kind of make sure that you got out of this what you wanted instead of just listening to me drone on about stuff. Yeah. So nearsightedness. What can we do about it? Right. Okay. That's not my area of expertise, but I'll, I'll give you my two cents about it. What is your expertise? My expertise is LASIK and cataract surgery and corneal transplants. Mm -hmm. So anything in the front of the eye, basically. So I'm going to call that risks. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Anything else in regards to that or well, success rate? Right? This is good. And I'm going to add one more point to this, which is what is success and what is failure and, and making sure we are clear about what the goals are. Websites. Okay, websites. Uh, we have some links. If you go to the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute website, there are some links to different educational things about eyes and aging eyes and whatnot. Um, and we'll, we'll, in fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure if you give your email address, they're going to send you uh, some information afterwards. So you, you make sure just you write that down. Okay. Well, let's dive into this. Let's just start with this. What, what does the eye look like? So I think this will help explain a few things. So if you look at the eye, if it was cut in half, it looks like this. It's got a cornea here, which is the clear part that's in front of the colored part of the eye. The colored part of the eye is the iris, which is here. And then there's a lens inside the eye. And then the retina is like wallpaper inside of a room. It's plastered to the inside of the, of the eye. And that connects to the optic nerve. So basically, when light comes in, it hits the cornea. And actually, that's not even correct. The first thing it hits is not the cornea, but what, what comes? The tear layer. The tear layer. OK. A plus right there. So there's a tear layer. If we, let's zoom in on this, right? There's a tear layer. If this is the corneal surface, there is a tear layer. And that has a few components. There's uh, mucus there. There's oil, actually, that comes from the glands in your eyelids. And when you blink a little bit, you have, has anyone got a sty before? Right? So a sty is when one of those oil glands that's in your eyelid that provides oil for the tear surface becomes plugged up and kind of like a pimple. But otherwise, that oil is really important because it keeps the tear film intact 
and keeps it from evaporating too quickly. So if any of you know physics, if you go from air here to some kind of liquid, the light that's coming through there is going to change. And it changes corresponding to how different those two substances are. So if you're going from air to something solid or liquid, it's going to change quite a bit. If you're going from something solid or solid, or solid or liquid, it's not going to change as much. So what that means for us, for me and for you, is that when light comes through, right here, two-thirds of the focusing power of the eye is right there, that front surface. So, you know, if you come in and we talk to you about dry eyes and you think, oh, I don't hear about dry eyes, I have cataracts or I have this or that. That's the reason. Is so many people have dry eyes and it affects the most important refractive surface of the eye and it can really blur people's vision quite a bit. So that's a big, what you, what you touched on is, is a big, big deal. So we have the tear film, we have the cornea, the cornea is clear, light passes through it and then it hits the lens. Now, let's check off one of these questions. So, why, why is your prescription changing? Tear film's changing some. Cornea is pretty inert, it's not going to change that much. Really what's changing is, is the lens. And let me just back up and ask a question. So what is the first sign of a cataract? So it eventually becomes foggy and, and it reduces your vision. But the first sign of cataract, who has reading glasses? That's the first sign of a cataract. So the first sign of the cataract is when this lens, which when you're young, so my, my new son, that lens can change shape. So he can see off in a distance and then the lens can change shape and it can focus things that are really close, up, up close, right? It's that ability to change shape that gives us the distance and the near and everything in between. Excuse me. So, um, we got me a glass of water. So, just a little cup, thanks. Um, so, as we get older and as we start to need reading glasses, that's the first thing that, that changes. Now, as, as it progresses further and becomes cloudy, the power of the lens, as it gets cloudy, actually changes and increases. The power increases. So, if your prescription is changing, it could be, not, you know, it depends on other factors, but it could be that your cataract is progressing and it's actually shifting the power you have. Now, if you have, depending on which kind of prescription you had to begin with, thank you so much. Uh, depending on um, what your baseline prescription is, it could make your vision better, right? It could take it from worse to better. You could say, hey, this is great. My vision is getting better. The only downside is on the way to getting worse, right? But it, but it also could shift it in a way where your prescription is a little bit stronger. But in any case, it is not uncommon for someone to have a nearsighted shift in their vision uh, when, they, when the cataract progresses. I feel like a college professor here up here. Need some kind of leather, you know, sweater with the leather elbows. Okay, so we talked about the cornea, we talked about dry eye, we talked about changing prescription. So let's go back for a second and talk about pterygium. So a pterygium is a growth that happens on the front surface of the cornea. I'm going to put this up here. Okay. So if you look at the eye from the front, it looks like that, right? Now, because of UV light, wind exposure, dryness, the white part of the eye that's here can grow and actually can cover part of the eye. And that's what we call a pterygium. When it's out here, we just call it a pinguicula. And you may notice people have a little bit of yellowing on the sides of their eyes. It's typically on the sides because those are the parts that are exposed to the sun. Everything else is covered by your eyelids. That, if it's just on the white, we call it a pinguicula. Yeah. We'll send it, we'll be, it'll be in the email. <laughs> it'll take up half a thing just to send it, to write it up there. And, uh, but the tree, but those are not, we're not worrying about pinguicula. Those we're just going to watch. I don't worry about them. As long as they look normal. Now there, there are some, you know, cancers of the front surface of the eye. If things look abnormal, then we, then we get concerned. But typically a pterygium is a growth that's going to invade onto the cornea. And if it's small, we can watch it. If it gets bigger, what we don't want is for it to invade all the way to where it gets to the center. 
because even when we take this off, it's going to leave a little bit of a scar. So someone asked about what the different options for pterygium surgery. Basically, pterygium surgery involves removing the pterygium just on the surface. It's just on the surface and transplanting a little bit of the surface up here over to this area that you transplanted or using an amniotic membrane. So you decrease the risk of it coming back. And to your question, the risk of it coming back is usually about 5% or less um, with this kind of technique. So this is, uh, these are pretty common. Happen a lot in surfers, people outside. I mean, Southern California, people are outside a lot. So this is very common there. Yeah, it can. So it can in good or bad ways. So it, when, when this is here, this is affecting, if we were to draw kind of from the front surface again here, this trigium is encroaching up like this. And it's causing an irregular surface there that the light is hitting. Even, even if it's not all the way central, it's, the cells that grow on top of the uh, surface of the eye, they want to smooth everything over. So they may be thin over here and they may build up to be thick here. So it can affect your vision uh, even away from where it actually is. So removing that can help in that case. In the case where it's already grown really far, it's going to leave somewhat of a scar when you take it off. So that would be a negative impact. That would decrease your, well, your vision would be decreased with it and somewhat without it as well. Dryness, you know, exposure, yeah, all those things contribute to it. Yeah, usually, I mean, you know, if it's really small, it can sit there and not change for years. So we don't want to just do surgery on everything. But if we sense that something is large or bothersome or growing, then it would be an indication for, for doing something. Sunglasses, exposure, dryness, all these things can, you know, so wearing sunglasses, keeping your eyes lubricated, you know, those kind of things can help. Okay, does that help with this? Like, I'm not going to be able to answer everything about it, unfortunately, but, but that's what a trigium is. That's how we take care of it. And like I said, the success rate is pretty high, 95%. Um, even if it comes back, you can take it off again, so you have a chance to reoperate on it. But that's, this is something that I do. I do, yeah. Because it's on the front part of the eye. So let's talk about distance and near next. Is that okay? So if you break down what our visual experience is, this really breaks down to the three main distances. And I'm going to call those distance, not surprisingly, intermediate, and near. So think about what you do. Think about what would be intermediate for you. Computer, exactly. That's the classic example. And, and near is reading, work. Distance includes everything from like street signs, but also watching television, walking around, kind of everyday life, stuff like that. So as we, as the cataract progresses, right? Remember we talked about as this gets worse, the first thing is you lose the ability for it to change shape. And so you may have, you have, may naturally have good distance vision and you may lose the ability to see up close. You may need reading glasses and then you may need stronger reading glasses and then pretty soon, you know, bifocals or trifocals, that, that kind of thing. Or your vision may naturally be nearsighted, and you wear glasses, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly nearsighted, so I wear glasses, but I don't have any line there yet. Soon enough, I'll need a line or something where I can read up close, because the glasses are really just helping me to get to here. And the lens inside the eye is taking care of all the changes on the spectrum of what I need. This is really important to understand. So glasses, contacts, LASIK, all those things typically help us see well at distance. And then the lens inside of our eye takes care of the distance near the computer, the reading up close, until it doesn't, until we hit what we call presbyopia. And that's, that's when we start needing those reading glasses. Ask me some questions about this.
And so there is a muscle. The, the, this lens is supported in here by these uh, what we call zonules, they're little support fibers, and they hook to a muscle. And that muscle changes and that allows the lens to shift and change. It's somewhat of a controversy in terms of exactly what causes what, but the lens itself becomes less pliable with time. So it becomes actually hard. Where it was soft and could move when the muscle was changing, it becomes actually harder to where it doesn't move over time. So how much of it's the muscle and how much of it's the lens, that's a little hard to say, but those changes do happen. So when we do cataract surgery, and let, let me go ahead and jump into that and we'll come back to this distance near. So when we, when we do cataract surgery, we make a small incision here through the cornea. This lens has a capsule. It's kind of like an M&M. You know how M&M has a coat on it, right? So we, we make an incision in that, and then we break up the, the material that's in here, either with an ultrasound or with a laser, and then remove it. And then we're left with this space. We have this same support structure, the natural support structure that held the lens that you were born with. And we utilize that to put a new lens in its place. And we have different lens options. But suffice it to say that the new lens, this lens was thick, right? The new lens is thinner. And there is a lens that flexes and bends, but most of the lenses are, are solid and do not change shape. Now once this smaller lens, this thinner lens goes into this bigger capsule, imagine shrink wrap, saran wrap, right? So over time that capsule just shrink wraps around that lens and locks it into place. And so that's how, that's how we keep the lens in place. We utilize the body support structure. So people often ask, well, is it gonna fall to my eye? And the answer is, this incision is small, the lens actually folds, goes in, and then unfolds, and so even if you were in a ballroom fight, it, it, that lens is not going to fall out of your eye. Um, it, so this support structure is attached to the, to the muscle already. We're just utilizing what was there. So you're, so you're coming back to here. You're saying, okay, well, you're telling me, Matt, that my initial lens flexed. And that's why I could get these different points. But my new lens isn't flexing, so what's the deal? How am I going to get that back? And that's the, that's the billion dollar question, right? That's, that's what we're all working on. Now there are fixes to it. The fixes have some pluses and some minuses, and we'll go over what those are. But there's nothing that's as good as when you were 16. Probably that's true for most of the body. but. What's that? It was only last year, so you remember it well. You know, I mentioned that we can do this via laser or via ultrasound, the, meaning the breaking up of the lens. So there's a laser that actually will come in and shine a light focused on this lens and break it all into smaller pieces. It'll make this incision, it'll make the corneal incisions, and that's something that's not covered by insurance you have to pay extra for. The main benefit of that laser is going to be doing astigmatism correction. So astigmatism correction, I, I don't have a bow tie on. My dad used to wear bow ties. But imagine a bow tie, right? Or imagine, better yet, a, uh, a basketball and an American football. If you're a little tiny person on top of a basketball, any direction you move, it's going to be the same steepness, right? Whereas if you're on American football, one direction is steep and the other direction is more flat. So that American football image, that's what astigmatism is. It means that the cornea, this, is steeper in one direction, in one dimension, than it is in the other direction. Let me just draw that out. So what that looks on a scan is something like this. And this is where, this is where that steepness is right here. So you know in your prescription, have you looked at the prescription your optometrist gives you? It has like three numbers, right? You ever wonder what those are? So the first, no, you just give it to them and go over. So the first number is how nearsighted, how much nearsighted or farsighted correction you have. And the next two numbers have to do with the astigmatism. The first one is the amount or the magnitude. And then the, the second one is the angle. 
So depending if this was here or here, that last number would change. And depending on how steep this was this way relative to this way, that second number would change. So we have ways of measuring the astigmatism. And then when you have cataract surgery, uh, so for instance, when I get cataract surgery, I'm going to get astigmatism correction because that's mostly what these glasses are doing for me right now. If you have a smaller amount, you can actually make a small cut in the cornea here and here, and that relaxes this and, re and decreases it. If you have a larger amount, when you do cataract surgery, you actually want to put in a lens that has astigmatism correction baked into it and then rotate that lens until it matches up with this same axis here, and that way you can negate it. And that's called a toric lens. Both of those not covered by insurance, but both are, are good things to do if you want to improve your vision with your glasses off. Yeah. So we measure astigmatism in diopters. It's, just a, it's a word that we use, it has a meaning, but for now, just, just think of the number. So roughly one, one and a half diopters or less, we can treat with the laser. And the laser, what we do with the laser here can be done a little less precisely with a blade, but the laser is probably the nicest way to do this if you're going to make, make a cut on the cornea. And then, the astig and then over anything over that, you really would want to, to use an astigmatism lens. Now, the lens only goes up so high. It will treat almost most people as astigmatism, but if someone has a corneal transplant or something like that, uh, you know, it may not treat all of them. And then in terms of the cost, it's going to cost different amounts, different places, but roughly, um, I think here for the laser is around $1,700 per eye, and then the lens is $2,500 per eye for the, astigmat for the astigmatism correction. But usually you do one or the other, oh. right? Because one's going to do smaller amounts, one's going to do bigger amounts. Right. So, you can combine them if you want, but, but you get the man, most bang for your buck if you do either or. It's like cleaning your room. It's very satisfying, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. You take it out and, and then polish it up. It looks really nice. So that support structure, we, we leave that in place and allow that to help us hold the new lens. Now there are instances where, where that doesn't work out and the capsule is damaged or the capsule is damaged beforehand and, and actually um, we see a lot of patients who are sent to the university because they need the lens to be secured in another way and so we have a lot of tricks of doing that but that's, that's not the typical situation uh, with cataract surgery. The youngest patient that I've done cataract surgery on was uh, a baby who was two months old. So you can be born with cataracts and that's a big problem actually because the connections between the eye and the brain don't form unless there's a clear, a clear view. And so if, the, if a baby has cataracts, it's something that needs to be taken care of quite quickly. I expect the lens that I put in that baby to last its whole life. Does that help? Right. Yeah. What's that? It grows with your eyes. No, it doesn't grow with your eyes. They're going to need changes to things. But the lens itself is going to stay good for their whole life. So if you're asking if this lens is going to stay good for the next 30, 40 years, my answer is yes, it will last. Maybe the question is not so much will the lens last, but will it be the right lens for your eyes? <laughs> so good, that's a good question. So going back to the baby, the baby's still growing, right? But at the point where most of us get cataract surgery, the shape of our eye is constant. So yes, it should last for your eye. Now, subtle things will change, right? You may get macular degeneration or glaucoma or other things which may change the health of your eye and that may shift your prescription some. You, your dryness may progress, uh, things like that. But for the most part, that lens is going to be a good fit for you for the rest of your life. What age do most people it's, you know, it's very variable. Um, yeah, average, it's hard for me to even get an average. I think 60s, 70s, 80s, and it's, it's becoming younger and younger. So it used to be that we didn't have a lot of great options. I mean, you came in and there was no discussion about distance near. There was no discussion about what kind of lens type you want. You just, we had some lenses and that was kind of what we were going to put in your eye and that was it. But with what we have today, we have so much in terms of selection and so much in terms of options that, um, yeah, 
Does that answer your question? Why is it getting younger and younger? Oh, oh so it's getting younger and younger because A, people are, well, a few things. So the, the procedure itself has become safer. The, the lens technology has improved to where it can give more than just distance. It can give distance, intermediate, and near. And um, I think that combined with a general um, demand, demand in a good way, from patients that they want something done proactively instead of just waiting until things are really bad, those forces combined are, are what's driving things younger. And, and it's driving us to this gentleman's question too. At some, actually, many people are getting what we call refractive lens exchange, which is where the cataract is not to the point where the insurance is uh, you know, willing to cover your surgery, but they're also kind of past where they'd want to get LASIK, and we'll talk about why. And so many people are saying, well, I'm just going to do this cataract surgery business early. I'm going to get a lens that helps me with whatever I want, and then I'll be done. I don't have to do cataract surgery later, and I have some of the benefits in advance. So that's great. The downside is it's not just the lens is not covered by your insurance. The whole procedure wouldn't be covered by your insurance, and so that's more expensive. Yes? Once you have cataract surgery, can you have another one? Oh, hey, good question. So let me answer that with another picture. Any other questions about astigmatism? I'm not going to write mine, but I'll write, I'll, I'll write, so to say minus 1 plus 1 1.5 times 80. So this, this means it's nearsighted. This is the amount of astigmatism, and this is the axis, 80 degrees. Does that help? And then, if it's for glasses, it's going to have a plus, and that's going to be for how much is going on the bottom for the near, for the bifocal. Well, given the astigmatism, you said the angle, of course, has to be correct to then maintain. What keeps it from rotating once you put it in? So, uh, in terms of the lens? Yeah, the cataract, the, uh, the yeah. uh, surgery. So, good question. So, his question, so everyone can understand, is you put this lens in, right? And the lens, you can place it any axis, but you want it to stay there. So how does that work? So basically, for the first week or so, it works by friction. The friction of that lens against the capsule here, this capsule here. And then, remember I told you the shrink wrap? As it shrink wraps into place after the first couple of weeks, then it's, it's basically locked into place. So you need to be particularly careful the first couple of weeks on this. Yeah, at first, you don't want to be rubbing your eye or, you know, dancing around too much. So the retina, like we talked about, is wallpaper inside the room, right? So the middle part of your vision here comes to a part called the macula. And if you were to look at the macula with a scan, like we get these scans, it should look like this. Nice and smooth with a little divot in the middle. With macular degeneration or puckering, it can, it can have a different look. It can look, instead of like that, it can look like this. And part of this with the pucker is that the, the gel that's back here um, is kind of tugging it up. So when you do cataract surgery, we are changing a few things about the eye, right? This is not as big, it's smaller. So the pucker could go away, it could release, or it could, well, that's actually with traction. The pucker itself is probably not going to change at all with the cataract surgery, but with any kind of surgery, you can get inflammation. And so you can get inflammation back here that may temporarily worsen things, but usually the medication we give you after surgery, the you know, the steroid and the ibuprofen type drops, that's going to help decrease that to back where you started from. But what you need to uh, think about is, remember how I said our eyes aren't 16 anymore? It's not just the lens that's changed. So if we have a change here, and we have probably other changes, it takes all of these working perfectly to see perfectly. So if you have a change here and here, and I can fix one of them, but not the other one, your vision may be limited, but the goal would be to improve it as much as we can. When people come in for cataract surgery, we usually spend a fair amount of time talking about distance, intermediate, and near, and astigmatism. So, uh, and this boils down, this goes back to what I was talking about with my boy and my girl, right? Something that's right for me may not be right for you. Something that's right for my daughter may not be right for my son. Which is why those annoying questionnaires that we give you when you come in, those are important, and why you know, I would say 
you know, questions to ask your doctor. The flip side of that is questions they have to ask you and also making sure that you, know, you want them to be clear with you, but they really need to understand from you what your goals are because without knowing that, it's gonna be a little hard to guide you in terms of what, what selection to make. So with the standard lens, we get to pick one of these. I can set your eye to be focused at distance or at intermediate or at near. So say you have, you have a right eye and you have a left eye. Most people will elect to go for distance in both eyes and then they wear reading glasses up close. Now that's, that's assuming there's no astigmatism. If there's astigmatism that we have to treat, the astigmatism will blur things at distance and intermediate and near, all the way down. So if we treat the astigmatism and we set the eye up for distance, then we've got this covered, but these two are not covered. We're good so far? Okay. Now you can probably see that there are ways you could fudge on this a little bit, right? You could move one eye to here. So you have one eye that really covers the distance well, one eye that maybe helps you see your phone well, but there are gaps. There's always going to be gaps. You're just kind of moving them around. This can be great for someone, depending on their needs. For someone else, they may not like it. Some people come in and say, well, I want both eyes to be near. I've, done, I've had that my whole life, and I want to wear glasses when I drive. That's fine. We can set that up. But you basically, the basic principle here is you get one per eye. You get one section that you can check off there. You can. Now the problem, you know, notice I've, I've kind of set these only one space apart. Almost anyone can tolerate that. But when you go from distance all the way to near, one eye from the next, uh, if you've tried that in the past with contact lenses and you've liked it, great. If you haven't, then most people are not going to let you try that because if you don't like it, you hate it. Certain people do, certain people don't. And so that's why when people have tried it out when they're younger and they like it, then I'm great doing that permanently. But if you haven't had a chance to try that out when you're younger, it's kind of a risk for me to take with that patient and say, okay, well, you may love this, you may hate it, well, let's try it. Because if they don't like it, then I gotta go back in and take that lens out and, and change it. We only do one eye at a time, but it's the difference between the two eyes when they're done that causes the problem and also causes the solution, right? That's what helps you see a distance and near. So it's not until both eyes are done that people can make a judgment call as to whether or not they, they like that monovision. Now, just a second. So, so what I call from one jump here is this mini monovision. So mini monovision, distance, intermediate, intermediate to near, most everyone can tolerate that pretty well. And, um, and so that's, that's a great option for a lot of people. It used to be longer. It's getting progressively shorter. I typically do about a week. But I will tell you that there uh, are some Kaiser locations that are, are, that are working towards doing both on the same day. If one is bad and one is not, we can do one. And we can have the other one done five years later. That's fine. The only caveat to that is if when we fix the one, that the other one's not so far apart that it's going to cause that difficulty between the two eyes. And the reason for that is when you wear glasses, there's a magnification that happens. Even though the glasses are only so far away, they're just really close to that, there's a magnification that happens with the glass. And so if I have one eye that's distance and one eye that's really close, and I'm wearing glasses, the brain is gonna receive one image that's not magnified and one that's really magnified, and it has a hard time meshing those together. And so sometimes people come in with the cataract that's really bad in one eye, and, and the other eye is not bad, but I say, look, we've gotta do both eyes because we have to, we have to line things up for you. Great question. Typically, yes. After surgery, you're going to need to change your glasses. You're going to need a new prescription. Um, now, let's, let, me, let me back up from that just a little bit, and we'll come back to that. So there are lenses that you can pay extra for that will help you do more than just one at a time. And for instance, some can do two. They can do maybe distance intermediate. And we can cover this here with one eye and this with the other eye, and you have everything. Other ones do distance and near. and and we can kind of mix and match and help you see distance and up close. Anything in life comes with a trade-off though. Okay, We've talked about the cost trade-off, but there is a trade-off almost in anything in life, right? And when, if you're talking about how can you trust somebody or what questions to ask somebody, I mean, that's one of the things, you know, that's just true, it's a truism, right? So 
with those lenses, there's going to be some side effects. And one of the side effects is increased glare and halo. So you know at night when you see the car light and you see a little ring around it, you're gonna see some more glare and halos around those multifocal lenses than you will with the standard lenses, okay? So whether that's bothersome to you is partly up to you and your personality, right? Some of the questions that we ask in those questionnaires are personality questions, to try to kind of tease out if, you know, like most doctors are type A personalities, right? There, any little thing is gonna bother them a lot, whereas other people may be more easygoing and, and they're willing to put up with a little bit of those side effects in exchange for not having to wear their glasses as much. So it, again, it all comes back to that function and to the be, people being different. And the other thing I'll say, and then I'll ask, I'll, I'll take your question is, that if there's a lot going on inside the eye in terms of glaucoma, macular degeneration, terrible dryness, then in my opinion, those multifocal lenses are not a good option. So if there's a lot going on, other problems, then, then those are usually off the table in, in my opinion. This is where I'm not going to be able to say because it really, it really depends, and it's not because I'm trying to be avoided. I, it no, really no. depends on, remember that function that has like all the inputs, this, right? Yeah. It depends on so many things that I get people all the time that come and say, well, one of two things. I have a friend, they got this lens, they love it, I want it. And I say, that's not a good option for you because you're different than your friend. Or, or they'll say, I have a friend, they got this lens, they hate it, I don't want it. And I say, well, actually, it would have been. A decent option for you. So keep an open mind and um, realize that everybody's different. Everybody's different, but also realize the other thing I said before, which is there are always trade offs, right? There's always trade offs. And they may be cost only in terms of the astigmatism, I think is more just a cost one um, versus the multifocal has some trade offs versus the glare and the halos and, and things like that. There, you know, we have here, we have all the different manufacturers. I think they all have like, good lenses. And, and again, you kind of mix and match based on the patient as much as you can. Great question. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, that could mean a few different things. One thing that could mean is your insurance isn't ready to pay for your cataract surgery. <laughs> and the second thing it could mean, and, and, and this is, you know, all joking aside, you, know, you may have other things going on. Like sometimes people come in and say, I'm having problems with my vision, and maybe they just need to do a prescription or they have dry eyes. And they have cataracts, sure, but they're not that bad. And if I go fix that, they're still going to have all the other problems they came in with, and they're going to say, you don't do anything to help you because that wasn't the main part of it. So if things get really advanced, and in this country they rarely do, um, then it can take a little bit more energy in terms of the ultrasound or laser energy to, to break down the cataract and take it out. But for the most part, um, waiting an extra amount of time is not going to make it more difficult for us. With LASIK, remember, the, the LASIK for the glass or the contacts is usually going to get us here to distance, and then the lens inside takes care of everything else. So if you've already got to the age of presbyopia where you're needing the reading glasses, the LASIK options are to, and the LASIK changes the cornea. It etches the cornea and changes the shape to help your vision, basically to etch on what your prescription would be on the surface of your eye. You can set up a mini monovision with LASIK where one eye is distance and one eye is close. And that can be helpful. Um, but eventually, as the cataracts progress, you're still going to need to have that surgery uh, at some point. My typical recommendation is after 50, 55, I would steer people away from LASIK and just waiting to, and wait to have either refractive lens exchange or to have a cataract surgery when it's uh, that time. But earlier than that, younger than that, for you guys over here, sorry, I've always been cataracts. At that point in time, uh, if you're you know, younger, LASIK can be a great option. Now, I'm surprised no one has asked me a really interesting question. Anyone want to ask me? Do you have a LASIK when yeah. you're younger? How about oh. when you get older? <laughs> <laughs> is that the question? Oh, my question is why haven't I had LASIK when I do it? So that's what most people ask me. So I do LASIK, 
I haven't had it. These are very mild prescription. They don't really bother me. In fact, my wife thinks I look better with glasses on. Maybe it's covering up my receding hairline or something. But most of the surgeons that I know who do LASIK have had LASIK. And, and the studies, I believe, actually show that it's safer than caterpillar contacts. So I think the safety level is there. But either way, contacts, glass, they're not glasses, but contacts are LASIK. You can have some complications from it. So one more thing, anesthesia is typically done under topical anesthesia, so you have an anesthesiologist there who can give you something to relax you, but you're typically awake for this. Sounds terrible, but for those who have been through it, it's really not as bad as, as you would think. I have dry eye, I wager most of you have dry eye. It's very common, it's worse in our atmosphere, when we have air conditioning, it's worse. When the heater is on, it's worse. When the wind is moving, the Santa Ana's, it's worse. When we take antihistamines, it's worse. When we take a lot of different medications, it's worse. When we have birthdays, it gets worse. And then any hormonal changes, menopause, things like that, it gets worse. Unfortunately, it's usually worse in women than it is in men, but it is an epidemic and it's getting, it's getting worse and worse. Now, you don't have to understand, this is probably gonna be a big problem be, uh, my son, my three-year-old, if he wanted to, I mean, if I let him, how many hours a day do you think he'd watch the iPad? All day, right? He would just stare at that thing. So I, I think that we're gonna see more and more of this. Um, the basic things you can do are artificial tears. When you go to the store, there are a dizzying number of artificial tears. Uh, in general, you don't, wanna, you don't wanna get something that has a medication in it, like a redness reliever, something that's gonna constrict the blood vessels and then, and then you know, wear off. Uh, in general, there are some that are okay, but in general, if you get a preservative-free artificial tear, there are many different brands that are great, use that a couple times a day, and then ramp up based on your symptoms. And uh, then warm compresses can be helpful. The, yeah. the eye only holds one drop at a time, so you don't wanna just take it and you know, you water your cheek, but one drop at a time is good enough. Now there are, let me just kind of paint this big picture. So that's lubricants. The other part of dry eye has to do with our eyelids, right? We talked about getting styes and the importance of the oils there and keeping the tear film happy. So keeping those oils healthy, healthy diet can be helpful with that. Um, some people think omega-3 fatty acids can be helpful, although there's a recent study that showed that that may not be the case. Warm compresses where you help keep the eyelids from getting plugged up. And then there are a whole slew of medications like Restasis and Zydra and other things that can be helpful. Even on up to serum tears, where people, we take, we draw the blood and we spin it down and the golden serum we put into droppers and have people use that. Um, all sorts of things we use to treat dryness. But for the basics, over the counter artificial tears, a couple times a day when you're feeling it could be really helpful. So, help. vitamins have been shown to help decrease the progression of dry macular degeneration if you have it. But, uh, like I said, they, we don't have, I don't have evidence that they're going to help in regards to dry eye or cataracts, things like that. Eat more carrots. Carrots were always great, right? <laughs> but, right. Let me just say thank you guys for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Hopefully that was helpful. Yeah. Okay, yeah, fantastic. Okay. Okay, guys, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.